Good evening. It is a good evening. And for me, it is particularly a good evening on account of last evening. <clears throat> Our work here together last night <clears throat> resulted in uh, quite an unfoldment and caused me early this morning to write an article which will appear in our monthly letter for the month of March. Those of you who read or study the writings of the Infinite Way or have begun that and are not yet familiar with our monthly letter may hear more about it by contacting Miss Glenn. This letter is my contact with our students all over the world. We publish an edition of it in Hawaii and there is another edition of it published in London. And uh, it not only maintains a contact between us, but it gives me the opportunity of sharing with our serious students the unfoldments and revelations that come up each month. Now, <clears throat> last night the message took on such meaning and importance to me in an entirely new way that I will be sharing that with our students and as I say our serious students because only the serious ones uh, receive this letter the earnest students and I'll be sharing what came out of that for me they in turn will be applying it in their experiences just as I will in mine. To us in this message of the infinite way everything that we read in scripture that comes to us with revelation becomes a principle which is used in our life's work. In other words, our religion or religious life is in part an inspirational experience but always followed by a practical living demonstration of God's harmony. In other words, one of the bases of our work is the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, the Word of God becomes tangible in our experience. We do not live a life separate and apart from God. On the contrary, any phase of our life that has its basis in our human will or human desire we find ultimately to be an unhappy experience and an unprofitable one. We try in so far as it is possible to have our entire life's experience based not only on God but in God so that our daily activity becomes that of God in action. Let me just exemplify or enlarge upon that for a moment.
Last night I referred to the Master's 15th chapter of John, in which he makes it clear that if we abide in the Word and let the Word abide in us, that we will bear fruit richly. If we do not abide in the Word and let the Word abide in us, that we will be as a branch of the tree that is cut off and withereth. Now, bringing that down to practical living, practical application, it means that it is necessary for us to mold our lives in accord with spiritual principles and spiritual precepts. And so in practical experience we do this. Let us suppose that we have awakened this morning and uh, we know that ahead of us lies a strenuous day, a day in uh, which many demands will be made upon us, probably of an extraordinary nature, probably demands that we feel we will not be able to fill. It may be one of those days when uh, we know that we are not up to what this day is going to bring forth in the way of a demand upon us. And so in accord with our living in the Word and letting the Word live in us, we turn within, within our own consciousness, for some unfoldment, some revelation, some word that is to come to us from God, from the kingdom of God within our own being. And uh, if we are patient and sincerely realize that there is a kingdom of God within us and that it can utter itself to us, the word can impart itself to us from within, eventually it will come. At first, not so easily, but with practice, readily. And then we are apt to feel or hear within ourselves, He perfecteth that which concerneth me. He performeth that which is given me to do. And uh, immediately, a sense of release comes to us. The shoulders drop down. The responsibility falls away because we know now, now we have been given the assurance that we will not go through this day alone, that the burden is not exclusively upon our shoulder. And uh, with that, we will probably remember also he that is within me is greater than he that is in the world. He that is within me is greater than any problem that can face me this day. He that is within me is greater than any demand that can be made upon me. Now we have the very word of God abiding in our consciousness and no longer do we face the day alone but with God. It is in this same way that there are times when for one reason or another <clears throat> accidents of one sort lie just ahead of us. As a rule in our human experience we won't know anything about it until it takes place and then it's too late. But abiding this way in the Word turning every single day inwardly for guidance and direction, we find that we are told in advance, not only of its coming, but of our safety and our security. I can tell you two very concrete instances of that. 
One, when I was in swimming one day in Hawaii, and as distinctly as a human voice, I heard, you will be in trouble in a few days, but do not be afraid. I will be there with you. And it came again. A few days later, I had to leave Hawaii for the mainland, California, and the plane had just taken off, had been away from the island for about an hour, when I heard an engine go on my left, and I thought, aha, here it is. But the pilot did nothing about it, he kept going on, and... Uh, Again, I heard this noise in the engine, and again the pilot kept going forward, and the thought came to me, well, well, what about it? And instantly the voice came back and said, the next time he'll turn. And sure enough, on that third time, he turned and went back to the island, and uh, a repair was made. When I was here in Australia a year and a half ago, we were having a class in Melbourne, and I was sitting at a table just like this, giving the lesson to the class, when I interrupted myself <clears throat> and said, on my next plane trip, there is going to be trouble. Will you... Let us stop right here and do some work. And we stopped the class, and we sat there in the silence for a while until I received my inner peace. And sure enough, <clears throat> I left Melbourne for Perth, and about an hour before we came into Perth, the engine on the right began to rattle and shake, and we began to dip and a smile came to my face. No fear, a smile, because I realized that whatever work of protection was necessary had been done by our class in advance. And sure enough, that pilot just made a few dips to the left and right, and his engine straightened out, and we went in without any further trouble. Now, <clears throat> sometimes when these inner unfoldments come, it is sufficient to prevent any accident. At other times, something along the line, the nature of these two experiences come, but <clears throat> only to prove to us that there is a divine protection at hand. Now, <clears throat> there isn't a business problem that can come up that is not or cannot be solved in this same manner. A person who tries to run a business by himself may be successful or he may fail or he may be just a nominal success. <clears throat> but always subject to the conditions of the day. In other words, in boom times, his business booms and in bust times they bust. But the man or woman who lives in contact with this inner fire, this inner light, this inner presence, abiding in the Word and letting the Word abide in them, has no concern about business except to do that which is given him to do each day and finds that always provision is made, good times or bad times, some provision is made that carries him through successfully. So when an experience comes, as happened last night, when uh, part of the message that came through was not clear to me in the sense of knowing why it came through or what its actual meaning was, it was in the middle of the night when I awakened and the whole picture became so clear 
that I was enabled today to do a lot of my healing work in peace and in quiet and with certainty that the work was successfully done. Then, through this monthly letter, I share these experiences with those of our students who are studying them. They study the letter in connection with our writings and recordings for that very purpose, knowing that I am actively engaged in healing work every day and in teaching most of the time. They know that I'm bound to have experiences, and those experiences are valuable in the practical application of our work. Now, I'm going to continue where I left off last night because the whole picture that unfolded is fascinating and uh, inspirational. And this means, in the last analysis, practical. And this is from the book Second Kings. So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam, and Akbar, and Shaphan, and Asahiah, went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalem, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harahaz, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. In the days before the subject of God was even slightly understood, before there was a thought of God among men, certain things happened to populations here and there that puzzled them. In one place there was a drought not sufficient water to bring forth their crops. In another place there was flood and there was too much water for their crops. In another place there was a hurricane or a volcano and uh, experiences that we today would call fatalities took place on earth among men. And in their bewilderment, they sought for an answer to these problems. Eventually, when they found no answer on earth, no common sense answer, no reason for these unusual experiences, they began to seek for supernatural means to meet the situations. And out of this began the custom of praying to gods, asking gods for deliverance, asking gods for more rain, asking gods to stop the rain, asking gods for more crops, asking the gods for more cattle, asking gods for babies, asking gods for anything and everything under the sun 
and uh, no idea at all had evolved of one God and so there sprung up the idea of a God of rain and a God of crops and a God of fertility and uh, a God of this and a God of that a God of war and a God of peace and uh, it satisfied everybody that whenever they were in trouble of any kind they could run and make prayers to their gods of course when the prayers weren't answered it was readily understood that it was because they were disobedient to their god or dishonored their god or hadn't sacrificed enough for their god and so began the custom of animal sacrifice and finally human sacrifice anything in order to influence this God to do something for me or for mine the Hindus in India were according to all reliable records the first people to grasp the idea of one God the one God but a God of many facets a God of many phases it is for that reason that today many people believe that the Hindu religion is a pagan religion because they seem to have so many gods they don't they only have one the God which is Brahm but this God has so many phases and each one a different form or statue and so the world believes that they have many gods but they don't they have one and it was from them that the idea of one God went to Egypt their King Manotemp the fourth felt such a great respect to the idea of one God that he decreed that all of the statues to all of the other gods be destroyed and that his people worship only one God and for a few years his people obeyed that order but finally it became too impossible they had been so accustomed to going to their favorite God for this or that that they couldn't stand this idea of one God and they finally tore everything to pieces and made him uh, abdicate but King Manotemp the fourth had a friend his closest friend who at the time of the abdication fled to Ur of the Chaldees and he has become known as Abraham the father of the Hebrew race because when he went to Ur of the Chaldees he set up a teaching of one God and this has been the teaching of the Hebrews ever since never deviating so far as their religion is concerned from that one God although Hebrews all through the dispensation from Abraham all the way up to Jesus were falling by the wayside and worshiping Baal and worshiping their neighbors gods coming back again to the one God and then falling away and coming back but the religion itself has always stood on its basic principle here O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and uh, they've stood firm in that but instead of repeating the mistake of the pagans in praying to a dozen different gods for a dozen different things they invented a mistake of their own they prayed to the one God for the same dozen different things they prayed to this God as if they'd been praying to the dozen gods they prayed for victory in war that may not shock you as much as it should because 
There are churches on earth today who still pray for victories in war. In other words, oh God, let's kill so many of the other fellows that uh, he'll give up and uh, we won't have so many killed. Nice prayer for modern people. Not even worthy of the old ones, but it's still indulged. They pray to this God, they try to influence God in their own behalf to do their will. What they wanted, that is what they prayed God to give. When uh, the Christian church was organized 300 years A.D., They had evidently lost sight of the teaching of Jesus Christ because he had given to this world a new dispensation in which you did not bend God to your will. You did not seek to make God do your will or grant your requests or your desires, but you molded yourself to God's will. You brought yourself into harmony with God's law. The Master told us to ask, to seek, to knock. But he specifically said that we weren't to do this for material things or for the demonstration of what we would call our desires or our will. Nevertheless, Father, not my will be done, but thine. The Master indicated so clearly that even he, the Savior, the Messiah, was a servant. He was not a ruler over men, nor a judge over men. He was a servant unto men, and he demonstrated that when he washed the feet of the disciples and said to them that that was his mission. It was then the mission of the Christ to serve men, and it is today, not to be a master over men, but the title of master is the title of a servant, a minister, unto men. Now, when an individual begins to surrender himself or herself to God, seeking always to know the will of God and be an instrument for its fulfillment, The Word of God becomes the very Christ, the very Son of God in the midst of him, which enables him to successfully be a light unto this world and a servant unto everyone. Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now, because the Hebrews were praying to God to do their will and didn't always achieve it. And because many of the things that they did brought punishment upon themselves, they began blaming God. And out of that came passages like this. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. And you see, always God is given the blame for the punishment that God never meted out. It was only in the Master's time that the secret was learned that it isn't God who punishes us, It is the acts or thoughts of evil that punish us. Our acts and our thoughts, not God. When the Master tells us, as ye sow, so shall ye reap, 
He does not say at all that God is going to punish you. But he says definitely, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And he tells us, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Doesn't say a word about God rewarding or God punishing, but in the very act of doing good, you have performed the very cosmic act which returns unto you with fruitage. In doing the very evil act, you have yourself performed the activity of your own punishment. So it is with all of us, in proportion as an act of good flows through us, it really is not your good or mine, it's the good of God which we are expressing, but it carries within itself the reward. But also, <clears throat> the withholding of an act of good or the performance of an act of evil has within itself the power of returning unto us with punishment. The world has been told us several times in the history of the world, but it has always rejected this teaching. It wants to reject it because it does not wish to be held responsible responsible for its own misdeeds and therefore it is so handy to have a God on whom to blame our punishments and then to say I don't really know what I did that was so terrible to deserve this now out here in this room before we came into it tonight here in this room was what we may term a nothingness there was no good in this room there was no evil in this room there was no reward in this room and no punishment in this room it was just a blank now we have come into this room and there is a very definite atmosphere in this room, and any person at all sensitive can feel it. And the atmosphere, oh, we can use many names for it, love, dedication, spirituality, anything that will imply that those of us who are here are here for some purpose or motive uh, of good, of God, of love, of truth, of spirit. And you can be assured of this, that as long as that is true, as long as we are sitting here in an atmosphere of devotion to God, devotion to truth, seeking God, seeking truth this atmosphere of good of love and of harmony will abide here and uh, sick people can enter this room and be healed without ever knowing why unhappy people can enter this room and uh, be made free of their unhappiness worried people troubled people could enter this room just by the very atmosphere of, call it godliness or Christliness, which each one is entertaining here, can set each other free. Where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I, the Christ, in the midst. And so it is that as long as we are here of one mind for the purpose of God realization, God experience, even with the motive of being open to receiving whatever impartation of God may take place in the room, be assured of this, that this room is holy. This room is dedicated, not of itself, 
but by the consciousness of those who are here. Now, let us empty out this room and let the next group come in here with an idea of an hilarious night of uh, orgy, of drinking, of wildness, of carousing. And do you think for a moment that there would be healing in this room, or peace, or harmony, or justice? No. There would be self, there would be sensuality, there would be grossness, there would be every type of materialistic thought floating in this atmosphere so that if one of us came in here, more especially sensitive to good as we are, we would be so shocked by the atmosphere it would almost feel as if there were blue electricity in the room and we'd want to get out as fast as we could get out. And why? Because there would be an atmosphere in the room reflecting the consciousness of those in the room. And now you see, God has not entered this room to punish anybody. God has not entered this room specifically to uh, reward anybody. But we who kept God in our consciousness exuded the atmosphere of God. Those who came here in an atmosphere of self and self-indulgence let forth that very atmosphere into the air. Now, as nearly as I can, I'm trying to explain to you how the very thoughts within us, the very deeds of ourselves, bring out the good or the evil that comes into our experience. This I say to you from long experience, not only my own, but many students, that in proportion as we keep our consciousness filled with the word of God, do we attract unto ourselves the harmony, the peace, the prosperity, the health, and the grace which flows from God. In proportion, as we live our lives separate from the word God, in proportion as we live in a complete life of living our own way, in that degree do we bring the world's experience of lack or limitation or war, discord or in harmony. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, none of these evils shall come nigh his dwelling place. So it is then that the Hebrews refused to accept the responsibility for their own lives, but preferred to live as if God were for one reason going to reward them and for some other reason were going to punish them. It's a very difficult thing for some of us in this age to witness the many good men and women in the world who are suffering horrible penalties from other people's offenses, not realizing that they themselves have brought this on not because they did evil, but because they lived separate and apart from the word of God within their consciousness. Now, the master comes and he says to us, keep the word within yourself. Abide in this word let this word abide in you. Abide in me and let me abide in you. Me, the Christ, the spiritual son, the divine idea, the word. Let this abide in you and the word will become flesh and dwell among you and peace will be and prosperity will be 
unto your household. But let that word stay outside of you. Live separate and apart from it. And soon you will find that you are living as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. Now, mark this, for this is important. The reward does not come from God. The punishment does not come from God. The reward comes from abiding in God and letting the word of God abide in you. When you take the Master's promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you unto the end of the world. You will quickly find that living in that promise, living in that assurance, keeping uh, that I alive in you, will bring to your outer experience harmonies and joys and healings of which you have never dreamed. And yet, just neglecting that, getting up in the morning and performing our physical activities, dressing, washing, bathing, going to work, running a household, and not filling consciousness with this Word of God just sets us free to be the victims of everything that happens out in the world. And then, of course, we go back to our old uh, pagan ideas of blaming God. Now, <clears throat> because they have forsaken me, now this is back in the Hebrew days, before the Master, because they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods. That is the same mistake that is being repeated today all over this globe. Instead of having our utter and complete faith and reliance in God, we have been told to place our faith in bombs and prepare with lots of them and rest on the fact of having more bombs and bigger bombs and better bombs than anyone else. And there's no better way to acknowledge that you have forsaken God than to believe that God isn't greater than a bomb, that God's influence isn't greater than the influence of a bomb or a germ or a tyrant. The very moment that we begin to fear a power, whether it's the power of a man or a thing or an, ideo or an ideology, in that moment we have forsaken God. The very moment we have allowed fear of our body, fear of ill health, to enter our thought, we have forsaken God, for we have forsaken the inner realization and knowledge that every one of us must have uh, that God is greater than these. We forsake God the very moment we fear, because we only fear because we believe that that which we fear has more power than the God we worship. If we understood God to be the one and only power, what would there be to fear on earth or in the water? Now let me show you the revelation that came to me last night out of our work here. 
I saw as if it were a picture. On one side, an atheistic belief in material power, lots of material power, and the atheistic belief that it was power or is power, and all mankind bowing down and fearing it. And on the other side, I saw as if it were Jesus Christ with no weapons, with no swords, and just looking out at mankind as if he was standing at Jerusalem and saying, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, I would put my arms around you, but you would not. You wouldn't listen. Don't fear the power of matter. Trust the power of the Spirit. For the Word of God is quick and sharp and powerful. The Word of God is that. You know, there was a Hebrew prophet who saw that vision, if not in the fullest extent that Jesus did. He certainly saw it to a great extent when his Hebrew people came running to him and told him that the enemy that was coming against them was twice as powerful as their forces. And he stood there and looked at them and said, Yes, they have the arm of flesh. But we have the Lord God Almighty. And then the Bible says, they rested on his word. And then what happened? The enemy began fighting among themselves and destroyed themselves. And the Hebrews never had to go out and fight that battle. We have seen this in the healing of disease that sometimes we have cases before us that are almost frightening. And we sit there too and wonder, what is this disease going to do to this one and what terrible power there is here and so forth, until all of a sudden this vision of the Christ comes and says, what power? What power? Is there any power but the power of the Word? That is the only power. The Word of God is power. The Word of God is quick and sharp and powerful. The Word of God becomes flesh and dwells among us. The Word of God establishes peace in the midst of us. I know, just as sure as I know the two times two or four, that when a handful of us are able to stand and look out at this world to every man, woman, and child anywhere in the globe and say, material power? That's atheistic. That's claiming a power apart from God. There's only one power, the power of the Spirit. I can tell you that things will just boil up inside of Russia or any other country. Need I remind you that the same fear that is gripping the world today gripped the world when the name was the Kaiser and his weapon was a submarine? Need I remind you that the same fear gripped the world when its name was Hitler and his weapon was the Blitz? Need I remind you that the same fear gripped the world when his name was Stalin? And where are these now? And where are these submarines? And where are these men? And where are these blitzers? And go on to their reward? Will it be necessary to go through another bloodbath to prove that material force isn't power, that it's the lives of Christians and the consciousness of Christians that is power? It shouldn't be necessary. We've had enough of these bloodbaths which have proved nothing except that they were dealing with matter, threatened with matter, and didn't get away with it. Isn't it time now to prove 
what that Hebrew proved, that they do have the arm of flesh, which is nothing, since we have uh, the power of the Word, the Spirit of God that dwells among us. Is it not time to prove the message of Jesus Christ that you can put up the sword, that those who live by the sword will die by the sword? This doesn't mean that we will go out on the street and advocate that our countries give up what they consider to be the armament that they feel is necessary. No. It means that inwardly, in our inner prayers, our realization will be Ninety billion dollars this year for weapons. The word of God is quick and sharp and powerful. And the word of God abides in me. And if we, just the groups that I speak to in one city after another, one country after another, if just those groups could unite and agree that every day of the week they would spare one minute for the cause of peace. One minute to close their eyes, smile, and thank God that material power is atheism. But a reliance on the Spirit of God the presence of God, the power of God, the word of God, this is truly power. And the other is none power. The arm of flesh. All of this came to me out of last night's talk. I don't know how. I can't realize the manner of its happening. But I do know that in the middle of the night I saw this vision. I saw dead matter just dead matter as if all this power of armament was just here like this and couldn't move itself because it had nobody to move it and how can anyone move it if someone is standing facing them with the word of God in the, their consciousness now if I said this to the outside world they couldn't understand what I'm talking about. And it is for that reason that we cannot publish a message like this to the entire world. But I assume that everyone in this room has at some time or other experienced a spiritual healing. Or if they have not personally experienced it, that you have witnessed it in the experience of some friend or relative. And therefore, you do know by experience that matter isn't power, but the word of God in the consciousness of the practitioner is the power. And matter responds and turns from sick matter to healthy matter. Not by material application, not by the power of material force, but by the power of the word entertained in the consciousness of a metaphysical student. This has been going on, you know, for about 80 years, this daily proving that the word of God in the consciousness of an individual is sufficient to stop matter dead in its tracks and change sick matter into good matter, sick bodies into well bodies, sick purses into healthy purses, unemployed people into employed people, end strikes in plants, bring together harmonious relationships between capital and labor. I have witnessed the word of God in the consciousness of an individual do this and stop a strike dead in its tracks. You see, here you have a sample of matter. And 
there it sits. Can't move out there, can't hit anybody, can't harm anybody. There it sits. So it is with bums, so it is with germs, so it is with infection. So it is with everything that you can say represents material form or material power. It is nothingness. It takes an individual to move it. Ah, but an individual is free to do good or evil, except when an individual is faced with the power of the word and then they lose all power to do evil. That is why over and over and over again reforms have taken place through uh, truth in the consciousness of an individual. That is why healings of false desires, alcoholism, drug addiction has been brought about. The dead matter has been proved dead the alcohol and the drugs in the face of an individual who maintained the word of God in the midst of them, in their consciousness. The word of God is the secret. The word of God removes fear because it brings to light that in the presence of the word of God there is no power. Nothing is power and nobody is power in the the presence of that word of God entertained in our consciousness. We, he said, we have the Lord God Almighty. We have the word of truth. Ah, we must have it. If we are just a group of human beings thinking about our own personal affairs and giving no thought or little thought to the word of God, then it cannot literally be said, we have the Lord God, because we don't. We only have the Lord God in proportion as we have the word of God alive in our consciousness. Never forget that. This whole world would be safe and secure. This whole world would be at peace if, Men kept the word of God alive in their consciousness. Now, we will no more benefit by spiritual truth than the rest of the world. Not by reading it, not by hearing it will we be saved, but by the doing of it, by the maintaining of the word of God, the promises of God, the promises of the Christ, maintaining those in our consciousness will bring forth into expression the harmony, the peace, the health. Have you ever noticed a person ill and getting worse and getting worse and getting worse and then finding a capable practitioner of metaphysics and all of a sudden finding the process reversed and now the getting worse stops and gradually the getting better begins and then all of a sudden the complete health. That is not accident, that is not chance. The sickness wasn't the punishment of God and the health isn't the reward of God. The whole situation is changed by introducing into that scene the word of God, consciously held to and persistently held to until the demonstration appears. Many people lose their demonstration by their impatience or by determining how long it should take truth to heal them. None of us can know that for the simple reason that spiritual heal, healing does not take place merely by a change of body. The change of body only takes place because of a change of consciousness. And so very often before we get our healing, there has to be a change of consciousness take place within us 
to ready us for the experience. In other words, if I am ill and I'm going along in my everyday human way and determined to keep going that way, I am making no room for healing to enter my consciousness. But if I am ill and begin to realize that in some way or other I am more likely trying to be paganistic and get God to do my will rather than release myself to God's will, then when that change of thought comes about, I prepare myself for the healing and receive it. Whereas I myself was blocking it out by this old idea of forsaking God, burning incense, Worshipping matter, fearing matter, worshipping some material force, fearing some material power, that's forsaking God. But holding the word of God within us and realizing the Father within me is the power. The Father within me doeth the works. The Father within me saith to all forms of error thus far and no further. The word of God in the midst of me is mighty. The word of God in the midst of me is power. The remembrance 